Marshal Tito leads two days of celebrations in Belgrade. The occasion is the fourth anniversary of the Yugoslav Republic. From a Pathé News cameraman come the first pictures out of Yugoslavia since that country stepped out from behind the Iron Curtain 18 months ago. Today, the army Tito led against Nazi occupation prepares to repel Soviet occupation. With the anniversary celebrations lasting until far into the night, the Yugoslavs find time to reflect on the fate history has mapped out for them. Once the keenest of Russia's satellites, Yugoslavia is now just an in-between, precariously balanced between East and West. Gone are the Stalin portraits from the streets, where once the entire output of the great copper mines was directed to Russia, it now flows to the West for pounds and dollars. Helped by her rugged mountains and hope for Western aid, Yugoslavia is confident that she can resist attack. While mindful that Tito is still a communist dictator, the West moves to help him. For if Tito can stand up to Stalin, the possibility of Moscow dominating the world becomes that much less likely. In 1944, it had been the Red Army that had liberated Belgrade from the Germans and had rid Serbia of General Mihailovic's anti-communists. By handing power on a plate to Tito, Stalin must have thought Tito somewhat ungrateful in not towing the party line, in wanting to be his own man. But was he to allow Tito to get away with it? In retrospect, it was one of the most important declarations of independence in post-war history. Tito had entered Belgrade with the Red Army, who had transported him from Moscow. In September 1944, Tito had confided to Stalin his concern that Allied forces might be involved in freeing Yugoslavia. Tito feared they might interfere with his political plans for the country. He had repeatedly turned down offers of British and American troops to help speed the German retreat, even though they would clearly have saved thousands of Yugoslav lives. The Western Allies were immensely popular among the population and the rank and file, but they were almost as unpopular, rather hated, by uh, the higher echelons, because the higher echelons feared that if the Western Allies succeeded in having any influence in Yugoslavia, they would prevent them from taking power. They were very uh, conspiratorial, they regarded us with a great deal of suspicion. They were, after all, hardline communists, hardline Stalinists, and they accepted our cooperation because we were militarily valuable to them as they were militarily valuable to us. It was a marriage of convenience, if you like. Once Churchill had decided in December 1943 to back Tito's partisans rather than Mikhailovich's anti-communists, Weapons and ammunition had poured into them. With every parachute drop had come Allied helpers. Churchill had even sent his only son, Randolph, to Tito's headquarters as an indication of his warm support for the partisan cause. The planes that brought in the supplies took out the wounded that in some cases had lain for days near the airstrips camouflaged against German attack. Churchill expected the arms to be used only to kill Germans but they were used more often against the supporters of Tito's main political rival, General Mihailovich. Most had been wounded fighting the Chetniks, as the anti-communists were familiarly known. Indeed, more Yugoslavs were killed by each other than by Germans. I must have sent out five or six loads of wounded partisans, those that had very severe wounds, mostly gangrene cases. And as I would light a cigarette and give it to them, I would ask them, were they suffering very much from the wound? Inevitably, they would say, my wound is bad, but I wouldn't mind it if I was wounded by my enemy, but if I was wounded by my brother. And that meaning that he was probably wounded by Chetniks. Once Tito had gained Allied recognition in 1943, he by and large stopped fighting Germans and concentrated on eliminating his political foes in Yugoslavia. He had rightly judged that no guerrilla force could defeat the Germans. 
and that the liberation of the country was up to the Allies. That is not the accepted view of Yugoslavia's wartime history. Hitherto, the myth has been that Tito led the partisans constantly and courageously against the Germans, and that unlike the rest of occupied Europe, Yugoslavia freed itself. But the German records show that Tito's harassment of German strongholds was only intermittent and peripheral. The German high command's decision to withdraw its army from the Balkans was dictated not by the partisans, but by mounting Allied pressure from the Eastern and Western fronts. From the Allied point of view, the partisans were disappointingly slack in disrupting the German retreat. The Germans retired in good order, whereas the partisan forces concentrated on beating any non-partisan groups that they happened to come across. That was the first priority. The second priority was, once that was done, to rush as quickly as possible westwards to try and reach the western marches of Yugoslavia before the Western Allies, who had been coming up the Italian boot, and to reach um, uh, places like Trieste and the whole of Istria uh, before the British and the Americans arrived there. Film just received from Trieste shows quite clearly the display of force made in that city by Marshal Tito's men. To all of us who confidently hoped that the United Nations would await the decisions of a round table peace conference, the situation in Trieste was bewildering and alarming, to say the least. The Yugoslavs kept up a system of patrols who marched through the city fully armed. Even when off duty, Tito's soldiers and partisans kept their arms with them. By way of contrast, British servicemen strolled about without arms of any kind, and it may well be largely due to this forbearance that clashes were avoided during the height of the crisis. Tito's attempt to capture Trieste was the final straw for Churchill. By early 1945, in his disillusionment, he had already begun describing him as that well-drilled communist. On March the 11th, he minuted Anthony Eden, the foreign secretary, Tito can be left to stew in Balkan juice, which is bitter. I have lost my relish for Yugoslavia. Eden, who had never been a Tito fan, reposted to Churchill a week later, the United States have never been enthusiastic about our pro-partisan policy. It has always been with great difficulty that we have dragged them reluctantly behind us. Are we now to have to explain to them that after all, Tito has not turned out to be what we had hoped for? On April the 11th, Churchill demanded of the Foreign Office, let me have an account of the numbers of British officers and men who are at present at the mercy of these wild people. He meant, of course, Tito's men. A week later, he was telling the British ambassador in Washington, you know my views about Tito, whom I've never trusted since he levanted from this. By May the 20th, he was asking for the fullest possible dossier on Tito. Is it true that he was educated for four years at a communist college? That he did not move to fight for Yugoslavia when it was attacked by Germany, but waited till the Comintern gave instructions to all its minions to help Russia? That same day, he was writing to Eden, be very careful that our missions are not cut off in Yugoslavia. They will be looking for hostages soon. Tito's men had reached Trieste just hours before the Allies did. To Churchill's annoyance, the local commander-in-chief was reluctant to move against the partisans, because his troops had been told to consider them brave and worthy allies. But after a few weeks, during which the partisans had arrested and even executed hundreds of the local population, the Allied soldiers were only too ready to make a show of force. Tito backed down when he realized Stalin would not intervene on his behalf. Stalin's refusal to help must have come as a great shock, particularly as until then Tito had been behaving as Stalin's favorite follower. Many historians have argued that Churchill's decision to back Tito undoubtedly encouraged Stalin in his ambitions to seek further communist sway over the Balkans and Eastern Europe. Some have even claimed that Tito's installation in power in Belgrade came within a hair's breadth of prompting a communist takeover in Greece. Had Greece gone communist, Italy's survival would have been problematic. And had Italy fallen to communism, the momentum would almost certainly have affected the delicately balanced situation in France. In other words, the imposition of communist rule in Yugoslavia very nearly led to the communization of much of Europe. You may remember those rather cynical bargainings of percentage influences. As Stalin had said, uh, 
For Greece, 80% British, 20% Soviet. For Yugoslavia, 50% British, 50% Soviet. We couldn't, weren't in a position to claim our 50% because we had nobody there. In Greece, we did. But in Greece, in the end, Stalin withdrew. I have a sort of feeling that if we'd got some troops into Yugoslavia, that uh, we might have produced a coalition arrangement which would have spared the Yugoslav people in 40 years or more of a, a communist dictatorship.